Hey guys, welcome to part 3 of everything I've ever learned about the original Xbox. In part 3, I'm going to be discussing common repairs. I've divided these repairs into 6 major categories. DVD drive issues, hard drive issues, clock capacitor, trace corrosion, no power issues, and fragging. So let's start with the easiest and most common repair for this system, a stuck DVD tray. The culprit here is the DVD drive belt, a small rubber band that helps the tray move in and out. There's a few methods to try and unstick the DVD tray without opening up the system. One that I like to use involves using your hands to put pressure on the DVD drive while it's trying to open. Push downwards on the left side of the system while pressing the eject button. While it's struggling to eject, gently lift your hands. I find that on the second or third try, upon lifting your hands, the DVD tray will unstick itself. It'll probably need a little help going back in too, so give it a nudge. A more permanent solution would be to replace the DVD drive belt entirely. The replacement belts you're looking for are the Xbox 360 drive belts. Because of the massive success of the 360, finding replacement belts on eBay is very easy and very cheap. These belts will fit Samsung and Philips drives just fine. The Thompson drives, however, use a larger belt and you won't be able to use the 360 belts. So an alternative solution for the Thompson drives would be to take the belt out, wash it in hot soap and water, and then put the belt back in. 9 times out of 10, this is enough to clear out any dirt and grime off the belt. I forgot to mention one more good tip. If your DVD tray still has trouble opening, it's never a bad idea to lube up the rails on the side of the laser diode, as well as any other plastic bits that rub against each other. So now you know how to unstick the DVD drive, but what if you have a different issue? Sometimes you might run into the dirty disc error. This is an error that can occur after you put a game disc in your system. It will refuse to load and tell you that your game disc is dirty. Make sure that your game disc is perfectly fine and doesn't have any deep scratches in it. If you've determined that it's fine and that your system just refuses to read it, it's time to look at your laser lens. Now the laser lens on the DVD drive is very sensitive. If there's any kind of particles on top of the lens, it could really mess with the system's ability to read games. This will require you to open up your DVD drive and clean the laser lens. Use a cotton swab and isopropyl alcohol, preferably 70% or higher. Now very carefully and very gently, dip the cotton swab in the alcohol and begin cleaning the lens in a circular motion. Make sure not to leave any fibers behind and remember not to press down too harshly. After you've sufficiently cleaned the lens, wait about 10 minutes before trying again. If it doesn't work after the second try, you're going to have to start looking at other solutions. If cleaning the laser lens didn't do it for you, you might want to look into something called a pot tweak, or a potentiometer tweak. Now on the laser assembly itself, you might spot a strange looking screw hole. This is essentially a way for us to control something called a variable resistor, which controls the strength of the laser. The potentiometer allows us to tweak the laser diode by making it stronger or weaker. In our case, we want to decrease the resistance so that the laser is stronger. To perform a pot tweak, you'll need a multimeter and a very small Phillips screwdriver. Set your multimeter to resistance mode and check the resistance on the pot. Keep this number for reference. Now you're going to turn the pot counterclockwise. And when I say turn, I mean the slightest of turns. You only have to barely turn it before the value changes. Make sure to only decrease the resistance by about 100 ohms each time. You don't want to turn it too suddenly because a sudden drop can destroy the laser. Okay, so you might be tweaking your potentiometer and getting to a point that's far lower than what you started. Uh, so how low is too low? Unfortunately, there's not a whole ton of information out there, so you kind of have to kind of go with your gut. Uh, it says in this old forum post that Phillips and uh, well, Phillips can go no less than 500, and Thompsons have a little bit less leeway, and can't do less than 800, or else you risk damaging the laser and your game disc. Now, I personally never try and go below 1,000 ohms, 
and I figure if it gets to that point, the laser is probably dead anyway. Now this is a very frustrating experience because you typically have to disassemble most of the DVD drive in order to get to the pot. So there's a lot of tweaking and reassembling and disassembling before you finally get it right, if you get it right at all. As a disclaimer, I've done several pot tweaks, or I should rather say I've attempted several pot tweaks, and I've found that they only typically work about 20% of the time or less. It's a very unreliable way to get your DVD drive working, uh, but if you do get it working, it's a really good sign. Um, unfortunately, it still means your laser is dying, and by turning the resistance a bit lower, you're making the laser work harder. So the lifespan of the laser is still going way down really fast. It's not meant to be a permanent solution, it's just a way for you to get just a little bit more life out of your DVD drive. If you've tried everything else and you can't get your DVD drive to read games, it's time to look into replacement parts. Now you might consider buying a replacement laser assembly off eBay, like most people do for their PS2s and other consoles. Normally this would be fine and pretty cost effective, but the limited success of the Xbox means that replacement parts are actually kind of hard to come by. Even if you manage to find the correct laser assembly for your DVD drive, the cost alone is about the same that you would pay for a replacement drive altogether. This solution is still semi-affordable as of the date of this video. Replacement DVD drives go for anywhere between 30 to 50 bucks. I expect that number to rise a lot within the next 5 years or so. Because of the scarcity of parts, the replacement DVD drives are actually a similar price to uh, replacement systems. So you gotta ask yourself, would you pay about 50 bucks for a replacement DVD drive, or would you rather just scrap the whole thing and get yourself a replacement system? Okay, let's talk about dead hard drives now. If you have a dead hard drive, it's not so simple to replace it uh, with any kind of replacement parts. That's because each hard drive is locked to a motherboard with a specific key. This key is generated from the hard drive serial number and model, so it's going to be a unique key for every single Xbox. The Xbox hard drive is locked with something called the EEPROM, or Electrically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. It sounds complicated, but here's a very simple explanation for how this works. When you turn on your Xbox, your motherboard will interact with the hard drive and briefly unlock it to confirm that it has the correct key. If it doesn't, it'll throw up an error. If your hard drive is dead, it's going to throw up an error anyway because it's not communicating. Once it confirms that the hard drive is correctly programmed for that specific motherboard, it'll relock the hard drive and allow you to use the system. So the key takeaway here is that if you have a dead hard drive, your primary objective is to create a new one with that specific key. Now, soft modded consoles allow you to back up your EEPROM and store it safely on a separate computer. Now if you have the EEPROM backed up, there's uh, one way you can restore your hard drive to the way it was. Now the most annoying thing here is formatting the hard drive to FATX, which is the Xbox's proprietary file system. Uh, Windows won't be able to access the hard drive or see any files on it, and you won't be able to format it correctly. Uh, the only way to format it correctly that I know of is to use this program called um, Xbox HD Maker or Xbox HDM. Uh, I don't know too much about it because I haven't had to use it, but it has one glaring flaw, and that's you have to use an older PC to do it. You need a very old PC tower that uses IDE uh, hard drives, uh, because it simply won't work on a newer computer. It's not designed to work on newer computers. So unless you have a very old PC, you know, hiding out in the basement somewhere, I really don't recommend this as an option, and I don't think it's worth it to track down an old PC to, to get this running. There's one more method I want to talk about for using your backed up EEPROM to get a new hard drive, and that's a program called Chimp. Now, Chimp only runs on modded Xboxes, so you'll need another modded Xbox to get this to work. What you do is you connect your replacement hard drive to your Xbox uh, as a secondary device and then you run Chimp. And Chimp will allow you to clone your original hard drive to the new one and after that you can lock it with the EEPROM uh, that you've backed up. 
So always remember, no matter what method you choose, that it has to lock when you're done. Always lock the hard drive. Unless you have a hard modded system, it needs to be locked or you cannot access it. All right, what if none of those options really work out for you? What are you going to do with a dead hard drive? My answer to that is get a mod chip. Pretty much the most useful thing about mod chips is the ability to use an unlocked hard drive. Mod chips pretty much throw every security feature out the window, allowing you to run a hard drive without worrying about locking or unlocking. They'll even allow you to run the system without a DVD drive attached. Now be warned because you do need a soldering iron to install the mod chip in your system. But if a mod chip is the way to go, then I suggest the Aladdin XT Plus 2. What makes this a good option is it's very cheap, it's affordable, it's pretty easy to find, and I'm pretty sure it's the only mod chip still being made for the Xbox. It's also very easy to install, and I had a good experience using it to fix a couple of broken systems. Depending on where you are, you may be able to get lucky and get a local eBay listing. That way you don't have to order from China and wait about, you know, 8 months to get it. Now when I say they're cheap, I mean they're really cheap. Uh, I was able to buy some from Eurasia for about four, maybe five uh, US dollars each. So I was able to buy a few just in case they needed more. If you're buying on eBay, you can expect to pay double or maybe triple. Uh, I saw some listings for about 18 bucks. So that's something you can expect from a site like eBay. Alright, so if that's the route you took and you got your mod chip installed correctly, uh, the next step would be to choose a new hard drive. Now you have a couple of choices here to make. You can use an IDE based hard drive or you can use a SATA based hard drive. And I'll list the pros and cons of each one. The pros of using an IDE based hard drive is that you don't have to buy anything extra. It's going to connect right away to the cables inside your system and it's going to work just fine. The first big con is that the capacities tend to be extremely low for IDE drives. They just simply didn't go very high. I think 250 is about the biggest that I've seen and the price jumps quite a bit when you get to that number. And the price you pay for per gigabyte is not nearly as good as a SATA based hard drive. The other huge con is that they're very old and you don't want to really work with aging hard drives because, you know, failure can be imminent. You don't want to be rebuilding your Xbox hard drive, you know, too often. So keep in mind that ID drives are not really to be considered reliable these days. So now we have SATA based hard drives, which are still used in PCs today. And these hard drives are much more reliable, especially if you buy one new, you can expect it to last for several years without a problem. The same reliability can't be said for the IDE hard drive. Now of course the biggest con here is the price. So you're going to be paying a little bit more than you would for an IDE drive, but you're paying for a lot more in terms of capacity. Now they don't really make SATA drives in capacities less than 500 gigs anymore, and even 500 gig models are being phased out. So you can buy a 1 terabyte hard drive for about 50 bucks nowadays, brand new, and the problem here is that it's not going to work with the Xbox as is. You're going to have to buy a couple more products to make it work. Now the first thing you need is an adapter because your Xbox's data cable will not fit into the SATA port. So you need to buy an IDE to SATA adapter. This will allow your Xbox to connect to your brand new hard drive. If you try and use a stock data cable with your brand new hard drive, you're going to run into an error. That's because the Xbox has trouble initializing SATA based hard drives. To prevent this, you need to upgrade your data cable altogether to something called an 80 wire or 80 conductor IDE cable. This will allow you to run your Xbox with a SATA hard drive. As far as I know, this is completely necessary. Now even though these extra items are pretty inexpensive, they can add up and get you to pay a little bit more money than you intended. However, in my opinion, it is much better to go with the slightly more expensive SATA hard drive route than to go with an IDE drive and come up with some trouble later when it stops working. As far as repairs go, this would be the safer and more long-lasting solution. I have a couple more points to make about how to choose your hard drive. Number one is that your maximum hard limit here is 2 terabytes in capacity. The Xbox will refuse to read anything bigger than this, so definitely limit yourself to 2TB or less. 
The second thing you should note is that hard drives are often categorized by their speed, which is denoted in RPM. Slower hard drives will usually be around 5400 uh, 5, RPM or 5900 RPM. You want to choose the fastest one available, which is 7200 RPM. You can choose this hard drive in either a 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch variety, although if you choose a 2.5 inch, you will have to buy a separate bracket to make it fit. Otherwise, buy a 3.5 inch and that will fit perfectly in your Xbox. Okay, so you have your blank hard drive installed, you have your mod chip installed. The last step here is to format your hard drive and get the either the official Microsoft dashboard installed or a custom dashboard. So the way we're going to do this is use something called an Xbox boot disk. Now a boot disk just means that the system will launch from the disk instead of loading the operating system. Uh, Windows and Mac both have boot disks in case you, you know, mess up your system settings in some way and you can't access your computer, you can always use a boot disk to get into your system and reinstall everything. This is, will kind of work the same way. These are custom disk images that people have made so that if you mess up your Xbox in any way, you can rebuild it easily as long as it's modded. That's the big caveat here, is that you need either a soft modded or hard modded system in order to use a boot disk. In this example, we're using a brand new hard drive, so we're not going to be able to boot anything without um, using this kind of disk. Now there's three different boot disks that I know of, and that's Hexen, Aid, or Slayers. Myself, personally, I really prefer to use Hexen for everything. The 2017 edit is really well done and gives you a bunch of tools to do a lot of cool things and it's very very easy to use it to build a new hard drive. In order to use it we need to follow a few steps. The first step is to download the 2017 edit of Hexen off the isozone.com or any other website you find it on. Now when you download Hexen, it should come in a disk image format with the file extension .iso. If it's not, you probably need to unzip it. So after it's unzipped and it's in its proper format, then you can burn it onto a blank DVD-R using the free program called ImageBurn. Now you can use a few different brands of popular DVD-Rs, but I prefer to use uh, Verbatim. Maxwell's are also effective. Uh, keep in mind that this is just one instance. One time I had an Xbox that didn't read my Hexen DVD uh, that was a Maxwell brand. And I have no idea why, but just for, for shits and giggles I decided why not try it verbatim and it actually worked with the verbatim instead. Uh, I've never had any issues using verbatim DVDs, but yeah, just one instance where brands could be a little funky and may work with some and not others. It's weird. Whatever brand you choose, take your blank DVD-R and put it into your computer. Then start up the program ImageBurn, and you should see a bunch of options. Choose Write Image File to Disk, and then you'll see this. Make sure your source and destinations are correct. Your destination is your DVD drive, and your source is going to be the Hexen file that you just downloaded. That's a dummy file I made to show you what it's supposed to look like. Your write speed should be four times, and you want to verify and make sure it copied everything correctly. Then press that button over there to go, and it should start burning it for you. Once it's done burning, take your Hexen DVD and put it into your Xbox. Make sure your Xbox is completely off, and then turn it back on. You have to be patient here, because it'll take a minute to come up, but eventually you'll see a message that asks you if you want to format your hard drive. Follow the prompts and press whatever buttons it wants you to press in order to do so. Then you'll get to the main Hexen menu, but you're not done yet. All you did was format the drive. You didn't add any of the necessary files on it, nor did you put a dashboard on it. You'll have to choose the appropriate menu options to download the right files. Choose the option for mod chipped or TSOP flashed Xboxes. Then choose the option for disk upgrades. And then you choose New Disk, and you'll pick NTSC or PAL depending on what region you're in. After that, it's going to ask you to reformat your drive again like you just did before, except afterward, you're going to automatically download your system files, your custom dashboards, and it'll set everything up for you. Once you're done with that, just take your Hexen DVD out, power on your Xbox, and you should be good to go. 
So there's one last insane method that I've seen people use for uh, trying to save a dead Xbox with no EEPROM backed up, and that is building your own EEPROM reader. You can use spare parts to build yourself an EEPROM reader, which will attach to the Xbox's motherboard, and you can extract the EEPROM to a PC. That's kind of nuts. There's loads of tutorials out there for doing this, and I find it absolutely incredible. Unfortunately, I think this is another method that requires an older PC and an older version of Windows. So I figure this is not going to be something people are really going to be seeking out all too much. But it's really fascinating, and if you want to learn more, I suggest you look up uh, how to build your own EEPROM for the Xbox. Really cool stuff. Okay, enough about DVD drives and hard drives. Let's move on to something really fun. One of the more dangerous and well-known uh, defects of the system, of course, I'm talking about the clock capacitor of death, or the clock capacitor of doom, or that shitty capacitor, or destroyer of Xboxes, whatever your name is for this thing, uh, it has quite the reputation. Here's the full story. Inside your Xbox is a time capacitor that's just used to keep the time and date stored so that you don't have to input it every single time you start your system. After a few years passed, people started noticing that the Xbox wasn't able to keep time anymore and that there was something wrong with it. Upon further inspection, people saw that this capacitor was actually leaking on their motherboard. Now the electrolytic fluid that comes out of these things is highly corrosive, and any long-term exposure on the motherboard would result in a lot of damage. This thing has single-handedly destroyed motherboards outright. There is no repairing the amount of damage that these things can do, which makes it absolutely imperative that these things are removed from any existing Xboxes. Curiously enough, Microsoft has never made any kind of official statement about these capacitors or how defective they are. When version 1.6 rolled around, people noticed that they used stronger capacitors and it was no longer necessary to remove them. So Microsoft had to know about them at some point. It's also worth noting that the failure rate of these things is almost 100%. So if you have an Xbox and it's not a version 1.6 and you haven't removed the clock capacitor yet, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And it's, I repeat, absolutely imperative that these things are removed as soon as possible because they pose an imminent threat to your board. All right, let's calm down for a second. So what happens if you take the clock capacitor out? Short answer is nothing. Nothing happens. Uh, your Xbox will lose the ability to keep time, but that's honestly not a terrible thing. It's much better to have a working motherboard than to have a broken one. If the time and date prompt annoys you that much, you can always soft mod the system and it'll never ask you again. All right, so how do we remove this thing? If you want the short and easy way, you can just take your fingers and wiggle the capacitor back and forth over and over again until it snaps right off. Then you can throw it away, wash your hands, and have yourself a beer for a job well done. All right, but I have a soldering iron and I'm not a barbarian, so I'm gonna use that to remove the clock capacitor. I'm just kidding, it really doesn't matter. You can use whatever method you want. Uh, but since I have a soldering iron, I figure why not remove it the classic way. Uh, this is a method that you would use if you intended on replacing it, which I really don't recommend. I don't see the point. So with one hand, I have the, first of all, I flip the motherboard upside down. And with one hand, I hold the capacitor. And in the other hand, I start heating the other end. So I can pull it and heat it at the same time. Eventually, after kind of a struggle, it should come out. And I have a nice clean uh, cap removal right here. But even after you remove the cap, there's still one more step we need to take. And we have to clean up the motherboard when we're done. So take some white vinegar that you can find in any supermarket. And dip a cotton swab into the vinegar. And start using it to clean up the area where the clock capacitor used to be. The idea here is that there's still acid on the board that has already leaked. So we have to clean that up and we're using the vinegar to neutralize it and make sure it doesn't continuously eat through the board even after we remove the primary threat. Use a cotton swab to soak the area in some vinegar, but be careful not to soak any other parts. 
Well, after you let it sit for about a minute, you can go over it again with a new cotton swab, this time with some isopropyl alcohol. That'll get rid of any of the residue left behind by the vinegar, and you'll have a nice clean surface. Okay, that's it for the clock capacitor. Uh, now let's talk about trace corrosion. Now, trace corrosion can happen when there's um, contaminants on the board, and some traces get cut off, or they make you know improper contact, and they don't function correctly. In this case, it's the same spot every time, so we can predict what the behaviors are going to be. If you have any of the following symptoms, you might need to do a trace repair. LEDs not working correctly, power button not working at all, having the system turn on and off randomly, and having the system power on instantly when you plug it in. If you have two or more of those issues, you might have to perform a trace repair. The place you're going to have to check is on the back of the motherboard, right where the clock capacitor is on the other side. You're going to notice a bunch of traces running along the outside edge of the board. These traces all carry data from the system's power board, so that's why you get those symptoms that I mentioned. In order to make sure a trace is actually broken, use a multimeter to test two ends where the trace connects. If you don't get continuity, that's a sign that you need to jump the two points with a wire by soldering the wire from one end to the other. Now I have a video where I detail how I do trace repairs, but you can find other videos too. It's a very common problem. Check out my past video for more information. Now this repair requires some amateur soldering skills. If this is something you want to work on or get into, then I really recommend you give it a shot. Alright, let's move on to the next area of repairs. Uh, no power issues. Now when I say no power, I mean no power. Uh, if you have your Xbox plugged into the wall, and you press the on button, and you press the eject button, and nothing happens, you don't hear any fans going, you don't hear anything whirring up or anything like that. If it's dead quiet, you've got a no power issue. In my experience, this problem is caused by one of two things. Bad capacitors or a bad solder job on the power plug. Let's start with the bad capacitor problem. Now I've done this repair for two different systems now and it's always been the same group of capacitors that have failed. In the same spot. Take a look at this picture I took of the motherboard power connector. All the capacitors around this area seem to be in bad shape. One of them is very clearly leaking and all the other ones are bulging at the top. If you were to run your finger on the top of uh, any capacitor, it should be completely flat. If it's bulging at the sides or the top, that's a surefire way for you to know that they need to be replaced. Check out my past video where I fix this issue by replacing all five capacitors with new ones. Without making that video again, I just want to reiterate a couple of important things to note. When you're replacing capacitors, you have to match the capacitance, which is measured in microfarads, and the voltage, which is measured in V for volts. You must match the capacitance or get as close as you can to it. In this case, we have 3300 microfarads and 6.3 volts. Each capacitor labels everything on the side so you can easily find out what you need. Now I want to clarify that's at least 6.3 volts. It's okay to go higher. I replaced my caps with uh, ones that were 3300 microfarads and 10 volts. As long as you match the voltage or go higher, you'll be fine. Once those capacitors are correctly installed, you should be able to power on your machine again. So let's talk about the other possible culprit of the no power issue. Take a look at your power supply board and make sure that the capacitors aren't bulging here. Once you confirm that the capacitors are fine, flip the power board upside down. Now look at the solder joints that actually hold the power plug in place. On the earliest Xboxes, these power supplies were so cheap that these solder joints had a habit of cracking. After plugging and unplugging the power cord so many times, what can happen is that these solder joints can completely fail and then you won't be able to power on your machine anymore. Now that's the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, this thing can actually cause a fire in your home. Now don't start to panic because I've never seen it get that bad before except on the internet, but it pays to be a little bit cautious. 
Using a keen eye, make sure that there's no cracks visible on this part of the power supply board. If it really makes you nervous, you can get your soldering iron and just simply reflow this part of the board and make sure it's nice and sturdy. Now this problem affected a lot of early Xboxes and Microsoft was forced to make a statement about it. Now instead of doing a system recall, they decided to offer all Xbox owners a free power cord that was designed to prevent this issue in the future. The only problem is it doesn't really solve the problem at all. The new power cord is just designed to cut power to the system before it can light your house on fire, but it doesn't protect your Xbox from getting fried and certainly doesn't fix these bad power supplies. So consider yourself warned. Okay, so there's one last area of repairs that I want to talk about, and that's fragging, or flashing red and green lights. This problem will manifest itself in a very particular way. You'll turn on your Xbox, and then after a couple of seconds, it'll turn itself off, then it'll turn itself back on automatically, then it'll turn itself off, and then the next time it powers itself on, you'll get flashing red and green lights with no error display on your TV whatsoever. Now you can get this error when you're trying to install a mod chip and something goes wrong. Maybe your soldering wasn't good or your wiring was wrong, but that's no big deal because you can go back and double check everything and try again. If you get this error and you have nothing to do with mod chips, then you're in a lot of trouble. This error indicates fatal hardware malfunction. It's when one chip is just not communicating with the rest of the way it should, or just something is not right and not allowing the Xbox BIOS to load at all. This is not something a mod chip can fix, nor is it something that is easy to diagnose. I've personally run into two Xboxes with this error, and it's seriously like a brick wall. Like once you get to this error, you just have to stop and you just you can't get past it. I mean, I attribute it to the clock capacitor doing its thing, uh, and unfortunately, no amount of cleaning I've done was able to you know, undo the damage that it's done to the board. The first time it happened to me, I coughed up the money and got a replacement motherboard off eBay. The second time, I decided it was better for me to just salvage all the parts and try to use it to save future Xboxes. Which it did. I mean, I used the case to uh, replace a, another cracked case that I found. I used a DVD drive that somehow still worked. I was able to use the heatsink uh, clips. Those are really hard to find. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So it actually worked out. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't save that one Xbox though. But, you know, you can't save them all. Okay, so I ran my mouth for a little while and now I'm realizing uh, this video is now almost an hour long, so I just want to wrap it up now. I think I've talked about everything I wanted to talk about. Um, I've definitely discussed all the most common repairs that I've had to deal with before, and certainly there's you know so much more to it than that. I mean, people have some really sp specialized problems. But these are common ones that you're definitely going to find, you know, in the wild. If you're the kind of guy like me who likes to buy broken systems off eBay, this is the kind of stuff you're going to run into most of the time. Alright, final thought. Uh, I hope this video helps somebody. I hope it serves you well in whatever you're doing. I hope you guys stick around for part 4 of this series where I'm going to be doing a full disassembly of the Xbox. And I know people have done this stuff to death, there's a million videos about it, but in my experience, uh, they're all really frustrating because they all stop short of the finish line. Just when you think they're about to take it completely apart, they just stop and call it a day. So I want to do it right, I want to take it completely apart, show you how to take it all the way down to the individual parts, and uh, it should be fun. So, as always... Thanks for watching and have a good one.